there that we now call Brooklyn. The seven men represent part of the early slave trade. Slavery in Brooklyn continued and grew, but soon those enslaved were African or of African descent. By 1746, enslavers claimed ownership of over half of all Brooklyn land. We acknowledge the theft of land, culture, and lives in the ensuing enslavement of the indigenous and African peoples that occurred here. These early policies set the stage for centuries of systemic racism. As we remember these atrocities, town meeting members and the larger town must commit ourselves to address the ongoing inequities that are the result of our history of colonialism and racism. Although we as individuals were not perpetrators of these atrocities, we benefit from these systems. Thus, we dedicate ourselves to addressing them today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Robinson, in your absence. All right, we will now move on to the discussion of Article 8. Article 8 is an article to approve and reserve monies that are received from the Community Preservation Committee for allowable expenses. It is brought and moved by Mr. Green and seconded by Alok Somani. It is found on page 8-4 of the combined reports. And first, I am going to welcome Nancy Heller to give a speech who will outline for you the, a bit of the history and how the CPA works. Ms. Heller, do you want our timekeeper to... Oh, yes, you have six minutes and... Um, Uh, we have slides. Okay, thanks. Wrong slides. <laughs> thank you. I can't. I'm looking at you and I can't see them. Um, <laughs> thank you. Wrong slides. Wrong slides, Nancy. Wrong slides. Oh, yeah, that's the wrong one. Oh. That was the one I didn't get to give. If you'd like to hear it, I'm happy to accommodate. Okay, and now we have bumps tonight, so why not? That's what happens when you come back in person. So say hi to your neighbor. Say nice to meet you. <laughs> I like your name tag. We're waiting for them to pull up your slides. Do, can you proceed without them? You can? Or Okay, I, I can't hear you. I will make a correction. Um, actually, it's Mr. Dowdy who is seconding uh, this motion because Mr. Somani is not a town meeting member. Uh, Ms. Heller is going to begin and then go back to the issues that are brought up on the slides. Is that correct? Oh. They have a very efficient spam filter, so we have to be patient for a minute.
Thank you. Okay, here we go. I'm Nancy Heller, town meeting member from precinct eight and chair of the community preservation committee. Um, tonight I'm talking about Warren article eight, which is our proposed budget for the next fiscal year. Um, but first I want to give you some background about the community preservation act. I know there are a number of new people in town meeting and they may not um, know about the community preservation act, which is a state statute that allows communities to participate in a match of state funds if we will adopt in the community uh, the, the Community Preservation Act by, in, by charging ourselves a surcharge, uh, property tax surcharge. So we did that in 2001, the voters voted to uh, charge themselves a 1% uh, surcharge. And you'll see that on your tax bill. So the, the state also uh, mandates that before we get started in terms of applications and disbursement of the funds, we have to develop a community preservation plan. And that plan is a local is a document that helps local decision making uh, in four areas: um, housing, historic preservation, open space, and recreation. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a committee of nine, six of whom are appointed members of various boards and commissions in town, and three of whom are at large. Next slide, please. Um, we have a process. We're in the box in the middle, which says March 2023 to May 2023, and we have hired a consultant. We have uh, we first developed the RFQ, hired the consultant, and now we are um, uh, beginning our com community engagement. We ho held focus groups uh, about a month ago. Um, we are uh, have sent out. You should have gotten in your uh, emails from me a survey and um, a invitation to an open house on on June 5th at 22 Tappan, and we hope you will come. And that's an opportunity to, for, for you to express your opinions about these various uh, funding uh, categories. Um, our next slide, please. Our meeting schedule in 2023 is as follows. On June the 5th, you'll see that open house mentioned. June 12th, we are going to be holding an open meeting where we review the draft, our draft CPA plan. And on July 17th, we're holding a public hearing. And we will continue to update the draft as we get more information. In August, we'll review the plan and we will adopt it hopefully by September 1st. And then we will begin the application process. Next slide, please. We have... Um, uh, we're going to be using this matrix it's, uh, we merge the, uh, these three areas, community needs, uh, planning resources, and CPA allowable uses. Next slide, please. And this is a chart of the allowable uses, and it can be a little confusing. I'm not going to spend the time. I don't have the time to go over it today, but if you, have, you want to look at it and you can, uh, and I'll show you some resources where you can go. But uh, we also have a uh, file on the um, town website. Um, so projects are for capital improvements in general. Uh, they're an acqu acquisition of property, and they can't be spent on things that are ordinary maintenance or annual operating expenses. And we can't replace anything that's existing, any projects that are existing in the town budget. Next slide. The way we divide up our money is in these categories, 10% at least, a minimum of 10% for housing, a minimum of 10% for open space and recreation, historic preservation, 10%, uh, administrative costs, staff, consultant, supplies, et cetera, is 5%, up to 5%, and the rest we have in reserves. And we will either spend that money or it will roll over the next year if we don't have the enough applications. Um, this particular year, fiscal year 24, um, we have an appropriation uh, of, um, we have in, in the administrative budget of 177500 
The budgeted reserves would be 1.9775000. Open space and recreation, 465,000 in each of the three budgeted areas. Next slide, please. I'll tell you how we got there. In fiscal 23, we had a we only uh, authorized 355,000 for fiscal year 24. And that turned out to be too low. So we were not in compliance. And it was because the state had sort of had a lot of wrangling about what they were going to do uh, with the CPA match and the funding. And so we've engaged in what we call it, the state calls a true up. And we've allocated 110,000 in each of the other category, each of the categories. I'll never make it, John. Each of the categories, uh, <laughs> um, uh, so that we uh, comply with the law. Uh, our current next slide, please. Our current budget for uh, that we will have to spend in fiscal year 25 is approximately a little bit less than uh, 10, 10 million dollars, and it's divided in those in those ways that you see on the screen. Um, so we very much want you to be involved in the, okay. We very much want you to be involved in community engagement. We hope you will come. The next slide, please. Yes. You're lucky it's early in the evening. Um, well, I sent you this stuff on, on at email, so you should see it. But the further information I want you to know is uh, you could always do some research online at communitypreservation.org. It's a statewide organization and they know they're an advocate for CPA. They know a lot about the rules and the regulations and they have a wealth of information. Thank you. Sorry to take. Thank you, Ms. Hiller. Mr. Green, could you please come and speak to us? John, you can start. Okay, I am going to try very hard not to repeat anything that uh, Nancy said. So um, on March 4th. Who are you? Uh, Who are you? Bernard Green, uh, Chair of the Brookline Select Board, speaking for the Select Board. So on March 4th, uh, the Select Board voted 4-0. We had four members uh, that the town appropriate and, and uh, reserve from community preservation fund annual revenues, um, the amounts recommended by the community preservation committee that uh, Nancy talked about. Um, the the uh, budget uh, or the amount that we're appropriating is found on page 8-4 in the combined reports. Community preservation committee uh, recommends a total budget of 3 million $550,000 for fiscal year 24. Under the Act, uh, Brookline derives revenue from three sources, a 1% CPA surcharge on the property tax, matching funds from the uh, Massachusetts Community Preservation Trust account distributed yearly, and uh, interest earned on the Brookline CPA accounts. CPA law requires that you, town meeting, appropriate at least 10% of Brookline's CPA annual revenues to the three allowed purposes under the Community um, uh, Preservation Act, open space and recreation, historic preservation and housing. Uh, up to 5% may be appropriated each year for staff and administration. Uh, CPA law mandates that the town create and the select board appoint Community Preservation Committee, which we've done of course, that would put together a, a community preservation plan, which is in process. Uh, the CPA plan will provide guidance for town departments and others seeking uh, to use a CPA fund. Um, and a very important point, town meeting must ultimately vote the appropriation of CPA funds, but only for eligible projects uh, that the preservation co community preservation committee has recommended. So as I said, a vote of 4-0, the select board March uh, recommended uh, favorable action on one eight. Thank you. Minute left. 
Excellent job, time wise. I call Mr. Alok Samani. Could you please come up and introduce yourself? Hello, <clears throat> my name is Alok Samani. I am an at large member of the advisory committee. I'm also a member of the audit committee. I'm here to uh, present. Article eight. I'm also going to do what Bernard did, which is not repeat everything that the previous speaker said. Uh, much of it is included in the write up. I'm going to focus primarily on a couple things. One, which is just to reinforce the notion of um, that the town meeting uh, votes to appropriate and reserve uh, based on the recommendation of the committee. Um, and the town meeting may vote uh, to reject an eligible project. Uh, project um, but, and may vote funding up to, but not exceeding what is recommended. And that's, that's interesting information. However, this year, because this, the committee is still in the process of creating their framework and putting together the plan, there are no projects um, on which to vote. At the advisory committee, we also discussed a, a few other topics as we reviewed the article, one of which was what sort of projects would the CPC consider? And the framework is being developed, and it's clearly uh, mandated by the law, the, the different allowable areas. Um, and the, the first step is going to be, uh, once the framework is in place, encouraging projects to be uh, submitted for consideration. The other question that was asked was how these funding decisions might be made. And what we heard was that the CPC is still considering what those decision criteria will be and is open for input. Finally, another question that was covered is whether the goal of the plan will be to have some sort of proportional funding similar to what the state is mandating. And the answer to that was, it is something that will be considered. Um, that, was, that was the end of the discussion. And then the advisory committee voted um, by a vote of 23 in favor, zero opposed, and zero abstentions favorable action and we're moving this our consideration. Thank you. Now, thank you very much. Uh, Jonathan Klein, please come to the podium. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> you are the man of the evening. And now we will vote on article eight. Again, the issue you are voting on is whether to appropriate and reserve monies to receive uh, monies received from the Community Preservation Community Committee for allowable expenses. A yes vote will approve this appropriation, uh, and a no vote will not allow the appropriation. It is uh, required to be passed by a majority vote. Make sure your tablets are awake and working and on the Zoom voting page. And we will start the vote now. And the uh, motion passes, 222 yes, zero no, and three abstentions. Excellent. Now we will move on to, the, uh, to Article 9. Article 9 is found at Supplement 2, page 1, which was uh, filed and posted on May 23rd. And there is amendment, uh, which is filed. Can't read my own writing. 
uh, at pages 9.4 to 9.5 of the combined reports. This article would change the bylaw to require 50 signatures to file a petition, a citizen petition, to put an article on a warrant instead of the current 10. It is uh, moved by Neil Gordon and seconded by Mike Sandman. The amendment was filed by the advisory committee, moved by Cliff Brown and seconded by Jonathan Klein and would change the requirement to 25 signatures. So it would require 25 instead of 10 signatures to file a citizen petition, but not as many as 50, which is what, which is, what is sought by the original warrant article. Now, eager to speak, we have Mr. Neil Gordon. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Neil Gordon, Precinct 1. Let me start here. Town meeting is not a suggestion box. As we're well aware, although for some reason not this May, both the select board and the advisory committee have been burdened by a two-part trend, a proliferation of warrant articles and articles filed that are less than fully developed and less than well articulated. Town meeting, the select board, the advisory committee, and other boards, committees, and commissions involved in the process of reviewing, editing, vetting, amending, recommending, and voting on warrant articles deserve better. This straightforward warrant article proposes increasing the number of signatures required to file a petitioned article for a special town meeting to 50 from 10. The advisory committee amendment recommends an increase to 25. My preference is for 50. No change is, preferred, is proposed for our annual town meeting, which is set at 10 by state law. Why 50 signatures? The law allows us to require any number from the current 10 to as many as 100. I chose 50, the number of signatures required for a candidate for townwide office. 50 signatures is no great burden if done with the modest luxury of time. And few petition articles are so critical that they can't wait until the next town meeting, whether annual or special. For those that are truly important, rallying allies to quickly gather signatures is a viable option. For a true crisis, the select board can be petitioned directly. We can't know in advance whether this proposal will reduce our collective burden or improve the quality of petitioned articles. We can't know in advance whether increasing the number of petition signatures only for special town meetings will cause a shifting of articles from November to May. But I've been a town meeting member since 2009 and an advisory committee member since 2015. I believe the proposed change, if adopted, is likely to achieve, at least in meaningful part, the intended result. It's time to ease the burden and preserve the integrity of the warrant and our review and vetting process. It's also time to ease the burden on town meeting members and preserve the integrity of town meeting as a serious deliberative body. Town meeting is not a suggestion box. I ask you for a vote of favorable action on whichever version becomes the main motion. I thank you. Uh, Cliff, Brown, Cliff Brown, could you please come to the podium? Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, Cliff Brown, advisory committee member at large. Uh, there was broad understanding, concurrence, sorry. Couldn't hear me, okay, is that better? Okay. Uh, there was broad understanding, concurrence, and empathy on the advisory committee with the petitioner's views, mainly because we have all had to grapple with the issues he has explained. However, there was also significant concerns raised by several members. These concerns uh, centered on two broad issues. The first was that increasing the signature requirement for special town meetings would result in petitioners following the uh, path of least resistance and filing their articles at the annual town meeting instead, causing annual town meeting to be lengthier than it already is. One advisory committee member cited this possible outcome when explaining the vast difference between annual and special town meeting submissions in Needham where the signature requirement for specials is 100 versus the 10 for annuals. It was offered that a smaller change 
fear might be worthwhile to actually see what happens before we uh, go to the number that Mr. Gordon is proposing. The other issue revolved around the possible impact on registered voters who might be disabled, who do not have vehicles, who do not belong to larger interest groups, uh, who do not have much free time, who are not well connected, or who do not have a large circle of registered voters as contacts. The view is offered that changing the requirement might unduly penalize a subset of the population, and that this potential negative outweighed the possible benefits of the petitioner's proposal. An amendment to increase the required number of signatures from 10 to 25 versus the petitioner's 10 to 50 was passed, and the motion to recommend favorable action on warrant article nine as amended was approved by a vote of 19 in favor, one opposed with two abstentions. Thank you. Now call Mike Sandman to the podium. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Mike Sandman uh, speaking for the Select Board. Last, I have no uh, slides for you tonight. Uh, the Select Board voted uh, three to one with one seat unfilled, only four members, uh, to recommend favorable action on Warrant Article 9 as submitted by the petitioner. That is to change the requirement for the number of signatures for special town meetings to from 10 to 50 for all the reasons that Neil Gordon has explained. We considered the advisory committee's recommendation for 25 signatures, but we agree with Mr. Gordon, getting 50 signatures is not a burden. Really, any increase will reduce the likelihood that town meeting will be used, as Neil has put it, as a suggestion box by somebody who wakes up on the morning that the warrant closes and says, oh, I have an idea, and gets their significant other uh, a couple of neighbors and their dog to sign. Uh, putting, uh, putting it up to 50, putting the requirement up to 50 will certainly help uh, a great deal uh, to, uh, to alleviate that, that tendency. Um, 25 would help somewhat, uh, but as we said, um, we don't think that 50 is an unreasonable burden. Thank you. Mr. Ananian, and I realize there's somebody getting up to make a comment or ask a question, but there are people who have signed up in advance and they will take priority. So you can stand up, but you will be standing up for a bit. Yes, Mr. Ananian. You may begin now. Could I have my slides, please? There you go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good evening. I'm Scott Ananian, town meeting member for Precinct 10, opposing this warrant article. This article and the following one seek to deliberately increase the barriers to entry and make it harder for residents to bring warrant articles to town meeting, especially first time petitioners. I believe that inefficiencies in town meeting should be addressed in the advisory committee review process and with changes to procedures at town meeting before taking any action to disenfranchise residents' voices in town government. Next slide, please. In the special town meeting in November, 1993, a similar article was on the warrant to change the requirement for special town meeting to 25 signatures. Also, to change the deadlines for submitting warrant articles, which we'll discuss later this town meeting. Next slide, please. But this 1993 article was to reduce the signature requirement for 100, as it was then and still is in some towns. This article was brought by the moderator at the time, and I can't improve on his logic, but you can read uh, behind me. The larger signature requirement for special town meeting, as opposed to the state maximum 10 signature requirement for annual town meeting, provides an incentive to submit articles to the annual town meeting, as opposed to at a special town meeting and overburdens the annual town meeting with non-financial issues. In addition, the moderator feels that 100 signatures is an excessive burden to place on citizens. I agree. Further, as you can tell, the select board is under no obligation to enforce a particular signature requirement. With a vote, they can place any article they wish upon the warrant. Um, as such, in 1993, as you can see at the end of the slide there, they began immediately to accept any non-frivolous petition with 10 or more signatures. The home rule petition proposed in 1993 failed, so the select board informal practice continued until January 14th, 1999, when an act authorizing the town of Brookline to establish the number of signatures required for petitioned articles at town meeting finally passed the state legislature and allowed Brookline to set the signature requirement officially to 10 by the bylaw Mr. Gordon is proposing to amend today. Next slide. 
Brookline deliberately reduced the petition signature requirements from 100 to 10 in 1993 in an effort to better distribute the workload of town meeting between a spring and a fall session. This article tonight is a step back 30 years. The advisory committee amendment reduces the requirement from 50 to 25 signatures, which is a slight improvement, but we urge no action on the main motion regardless. Burdening residents is not a good mechanism and a longer spring town meeting is not a solution. I urge no action. Thank you. Anthony Ishak. Anthony Ishak, could you please come to the podium? Oh, okay, you are not gonna speak. Then Jonathan Klein. No need to speak. John Bassett. Mr. Bassett, are you here? Marissa Vote, are you swifter on your feet? Yes. And now the person who would like to speak, it's a good time to get up and get by the microphone. Good evening, uh, my name is Marissa Vogt. I'm a town meeting member in Precinct 6, and I'm asking you to protect our participatory democracy and vote no action on Warren Article 9. Next slide, please. Increasing the number of signatures required to submit a Warren Article is disenfranchisement. It is particularly burdensome for vulnerable populations who are already too underrepresented in our town government. Warren Article 9 disenfranchises people with disabilities. I know personally how hard it is knock on doors for signatures if you use a device that can't go up or down stairs. The first time I ran for town meeting, I brought my young kids along in their stroller as I went to collect my 10 signatures. It was next to impossible to reach many residences without abandoning my kids on the sidewalk. Please think about the impact that a 25 or 50 signature requirement would have on individuals in wheelchairs or with other physical disabilities. Warren Article 9 also disenfranchises non-insiders. This spring, I was elected as a library trustee three years after I first ran for town meeting. And while it was somewhat tricky to get on the ballot as a first time town meeting member, this year, even though I had COVID, I was able to quickly get the signatures I needed because I could rely on an incredible group of town meeting friends and colleagues to help me collect my signatures. I urge you to vote no on Article 9 because exercising your right to participate in our democratic process shouldn't require being a political insider. Next slide, please. I was the lead or co-petitioner on several articles last year, and I agree that there are efficiencies we could make. Before we move to disenfranchise residents, we must ensure that we've tried every possible alternate method of making the system better. There are many individuals or groups who could help. This is the wrong solution to the problem. The article explanation even says that increasing the signature requirement may not reduce the burden on town committees, boards, or staff but it will definitely place an undue burden on those who are least able to bear it. Please join me in protecting our participatory democracy and voting no action on Warren Article 9. Thank you. And could you please identify yourself, uh, masked <laughs> man at the podium? <laughs> Good evening. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Clint Richmond, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 6. One of the things I treasure about town meeting is the ability for issues to be heard. And I agree with those who said that this is an anti-democratic measure. I agree that 50 is a burden and that it favors organized petitioners. As a petitioner, I'd just like to add, as you work through the process, changes are made. One can't gather signatures until the language is finalized. This will not stop late filings. I agree we have too many articles and we meet too many nights, but we don't know if this will work as intended. And I'm not even sure we will be able to tell if it's working as intended at all. And to undo it, we'll have to have yet another Warren article, which is what we are trying to avoid here. Amendment, the AC Amendment of 25 is better, so please vote on that. However, we have other options to expedite town meeting. I'm still going to vote no on the main motion of this Warren article. Thank you. Um, gentlemen. Jeffrey Benson, <clears throat> town meeting member precinct three. I was actually not sure how I was going to vote on this. And when I heard Mr. Gordon suggest that people's valid concerns are just suggestion box items versus his valid concerns made me realize 
it's a position of privilege to call somebody else's concerns merely a suggestion. They are likely just as important to them and to the community as anyone else's warrant articles. When Mr. Sandman, who I greatly admire and respect, suggested that someone who has only 10 signatures probably just woke up that morning with that idea and got their dog to sign it, that's the meaning to people who are interested in that warrant article as well, and for a variety of reasons, got 10 signatures. I would like to support every person who's making the effort to make the town better through whatever means they have to bring to us their ideas, which are not merely suggestion boxes, but their passions for making the town better. And for these reasons, I am opposing this. Mr. Fried Mr. Friedman. Yes, um, Harry Friedman, Precinct 12 Advisory Committee. I stand and urge people to vote in favor of the requirement of 25 and then to vote against the entire thing. I ordinarily wouldn't just stand here and tell people what to do, but given that this is probably the second time the Scott and Annie and I have ever agreed on anything, and I believe the first time that Marissa Vogt and I have ever agreed on anything, um, I thought this historic night should be commemorated. Mr. Toffel. Uh, Mike Toffel, town meeting member, precinct eight. So for, we've heard a lot of testimony uh, from the community here of town meeting members about the potential costs of this, of these changes, either 25 or 50. And I'm, I'm curious, given we have a petitioner who's thought about this for a long time, the select board that's had a hearing about this and a, a numerous members on the advisory committee who favor increasing from our current 10. Can you share with us any evidence you have that the late filers, which I think is what town meeting member Gordon was concerned about, those who get up the day before the deadline and rush around and get 10, that those are of lower quality than other uh, than other warrant articles that are filed. Because it seems like that there should be ample evidence to support that claim. And I wonder if there is any. Thank you. As a question for the petitioner or AC, uh, if you please, Madam Moderator. Uh, Mr. Gordon, was that uh, something about the position you took. Meetings. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Neil Gordon, Precinct One. I've, I, you know, I don't have a spreadsheet. Uh, I have significant anecdotal experience. I've been on the sixth floor uh, when uh, the warrant closes. I've been there where uh, uh, warrant articles were in fact drafted uh, at the last minute, I believe. Uh, I was on the sixth floor, 15 minutes to noon, with inadequate signatures, not mine, inadequate signatures on petitions. You can wait as people come in to file warrant articles and ask, could you please sign mine? Uh, yes, I have reason to believe that the quality of warrant articles as filed and the burden that's placed on both the select board and in particular on the advisory committee and the subcommittee suffer because of the ease of uh, filing warrant articles. Uh, I refer to a tweet uh, that uh, uh, I don't need to identify the uh, author. It uh, uh, was posted when the warrant opened. Have any ideas? Good ideas. Have any good ideas? All it takes is 10 signatures on a petition and you too can have a warrant article. Uh, words to that effect. The uh, Town meeting is a serious, deliberative legislature. It may be grassroots, it may be town, but it is not casual. We do serious business here, and there is serious burden on the system when Warren articles, and we heard this tonight from Mr. Nanian, there is this notion that it's the advisory committee's job to correct Warren articles, make them better, write, vet them, yes, rewrite them, redraft them. What the advisory committee members will, will tell you often is we have to, because if we don't, town meeting might pass them for whatever passionate reason, and they become law, they become bylaw. We're bound by them. We, we need to do better. Thank you. 
I rise to a point of personal privilege, please. I don't believe I said any of that. I have my remarks written right here. Thank you. Said it all. Ms. Hummel. Thank you. Amy Hummel, town meeting member, precinct 12 and member of the advisory committee. I hadn't planned on speaking on this, but I do plan on voting for the 25 signatures and then uh, voting on the whole thing, um, disagreeing with Harry. But uh, one of the reasons is there are so many times sitting in, in meetings over the 10 plus years um, that I've sat on the advisory committee and, and how countless times, and I, I haven't kept a spreadsheet either, you know, we've asked petitioners, did you speak to the people in transportation about this first? Did you do this first? And it's it's okay if they don't. We That is part of our job is to help them work through and improve. But oftentimes, so those simple conversations that may happen as they're gathering signatures through that process, those conversations would be had, somebody would suggest it, things are made better even before they begin, or they can, you know, talk about maybe creating some sort of policy, working with, you know, town staff, et cetera, rather than bringing an article to make something happen. Sometimes there are much more efficient, elegant ways to get things done that bringing more people in early can help with. You know, a lot of it's still going to end up in front of the advisory committee, the select board and town meeting anyway. Um, you know, there are certain things I believe that need to be bylaws and not policy, but um, but I think it is good. I think it, it I think it will improve earlier conversations even before things are filing, and that's what we all should be most concerned with. So I I don't I hope 25 isn't a burden. We'll see, and if it is, I think we'll quickly re revert it. So I, I hope you all support 25 signatures. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, sir. Madam Moderator, John Rumpler, Precinct 11. I'm a brand new town meeting member. Thank you for your labors. Uh, last night was my first time here. And because the theme of last minute things being filed was raised, I do want to point out that we were served with enormous numbers of amendments and last minute moves, including by members of the select board 24 hours before we were supposed to deliberate. And if we are supposed to be upset by last minute filers 75 days out, let me tell you, this was bewildering and unempowering for us as a citizen legislature to have to handle new stuff handed to us in three packets 24 hours before we started. So let's get to the root of the problem. In my opinion, if we want to stop last minute filing, the buck stops with the folks at the front of the room with all due respect. Let me respond to that. I'm sorry, sir, what was your name again? Excuse me, sir, what was your name? Okay, let me explain the process. People submit warrant articles. Amendments are submitted. They are given deadlines by which they have to be submitted. These deadlines are eight days in advance for articles with budgetary impacts. They are 48 hours in advance for articles that do not have budgetary impacts. The advisory committee and the select board are charged with the duty of reviewing these, having meetings, sometimes subcommittee meetings, and reviewing these to make comments, adjustments if necessary, and recommendations on them. They had a meeting Monday night that lasted four hours reviewing the amendments that were then presented to you 24 hours in advance. Would their preference have been to do it earlier? Absolutely. Is it ideal to get it earlier? Absolutely. But you have to realize you have volunteers working extremely hard on tight deadlines. It is not ideal, but it is how our system works. It is not being inconsiderate. It is the best system we have under the way town meeting works. So that needs to be taken into account. It is really, I'm afraid, irrelevant to the issue that is being discussed here. And frankly, I think it is doing an injustice to the incredible work performed by the select board and the hours they dedicate to all of the things that are submitted, including the amendments that are filed by petitioners 
and other town meeting members, and an injustice to the work of the advisory committee. As a new town meeting member, it's your first experience and yes, it is overwhelming, but it's one of the duties of being a town meeting member and I welcome you and I welcome you getting used to this big responsibility and joining this collegial group. Thank you. Madam moderator, the issue that was raised is a proposal to change okay, are, the rules of town meeting. Thank you. Okay. Do we have another speaker? My name is Bettina Neuefein. I'm a town meeting member from Precinct 1. I feel like we've gotten derailed a little bit um, from what the issue is. And I think the issue that's been raised um, by uh, Mr. Gordon is a real one. And I think we want to be respectful of the time and the resources that it takes to vet a warrant article. But it strikes me that what the issue really is, is not how many signatures there are required, but whether there is an on-ramp that is accessible to people who have not invested years and years in already becoming literate in town meeting protocols, right? So if we want to be inclusive and if we want to welcome new people's ideas, the question is, is there a better way? And to my mind, I, I'm sure there is a better way, right? I'm sure there are ways that we could set up a protocol in which there is you know, maybe a separate committee of people who volunteer to, to shepherd people who are first time um, warrant article bringers so that we can avoid some of these, uh, these procedural problems. But to my mind, increasing the number of signatures does not address this problem. So I plan to vote no on this and I would invite somebody who, um, who does have time and inclination to propose a solution to, in fact, address the problem. Thank you. Mr. Wang? Hi, uh, I'm A. Wang Wang, uh, like a precinct a committee member. Yeah, so uh, first I would like to appreciate the advisory committee and also select board because like, I don't know how come they have so, much, so many times to review all of these. Every time I join the meeting is uh, four hours and they have, everybody has a, a lot of debate. So I really appreciate for that. And so for their service. So I would like to say is like, uh, I, th I think that the problem is like, uh, it, uh, the warrant article submission should, uh, the advisory committee should not be a warranty writing school. It's not a tutoring school. So I think the process probably, we instead of like uh, people, I mean I'm like- sorry, is this, is this relevant to the issue of yes, timing? Yes, so what I'm trying to say is like, uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is that we need to have a protocol that, that, uh, and also like uh, maybe have a certain process to writing down. If you want to write in a one article, you need to go through the certain process to see if you address finding the correct person in the town and then getting the information. So if we have a certain like uh, forms, help, everybody to prepare the one article that can reduce the time for the advisory committee and everyone. And personally, I still against for like adding additional one because for us, the, the first or second time, second year for the town meeting member and us my age, I really don't have the time like you guys can advocate for the town. So I really appreciate everybody over here. Thank, Thank you. you. What I recommend strongly is our amazingly written uh, and drafted town meeting handbook, which actually has instructions for how to lay out the article and great advice contacting the advisory committee. But thank you for those comments. And let's get back to um, the question, which I have a feeling uh, is what Ms. Ashkenazi is standing at the microphone to do. Actually, am I being recognized, Madam Moderator? Uh, Mary Ashkenazi. However, we have had a motion to call the question. Was that why you were here? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then I apologize. Um, I need to take the motion to call the question first. No, no, actually, I don't. I am going to let you speak. Thank and you. Then I, then I will entertain a motion to call the question. I Mary Ashkenazi, select board member, speaking on behalf of myself. I think I was the minority vote on this one. Um, I was a no vote for all the reasons that have been expressed here. By the way, I'm standing on my toes. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and I, I just want to express that I appreciate all of the work that the moderator does. I appreciate especially all of the work that the select board office does, Melissa, Devin, everybody who works to put last minute changes together. But I do want to echo 
what the fine gentleman from Precinct 11, John, said. I think the issue he was trying to point out was that we deal with last minute stuff all the time, and this is not going to change that. And so I think that that is a perfectly good reason not to support this. If the issue is last minute stuff, then we need a policy to address last minute stuff, or we just need to accept it because it's a part of the process. That's fine too. But I think this is, um, I think someone's favorite term, this is not the right solution for this problem. This is an issue. It's worth trying to address. How we address it is really important. And for me, this is not the solution. So I encourage you to vote for the lesser number and then vote down the entire Warren article. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, there was a motion to call the question. Uh, you will need a second. second. Okay, we will take a vote on the motion to call the question. It must pass by a two thirds vote. No, there are no speakers left. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Well, you can say that I was, I had a question. Um, no, but, being, being in, okay, Ms. Um, Mark Penzel was left speaking, but since the motion has been called, you may speak only after uh, the right. decision as to whether right. or not that succeeds. Okay, yes, wake up your machines, get on the Zoom page, and we'll see. You were going to redo the vote, don't worry. Okay. We're going to start again, get on the Zoom page. Wait, is everyone ready? Okay. We're going to start again. We need a two-thirds majority. Okay, the motion passes with 189 yes, 41 no, and five abstentions. I'm sorry, Mr. Penzel, you do not. I, I had a question in the nature that- uh, our... The discussion's done. Okay, it was, a, it was a question the same way to clarify what we're voting on? We are not voting on anything yet. Well, I will clarify to, it. I will clarify, now that we're voting, I, I, now that we are actually substantively voting, what we were voting on then was whether or not to vote. I apologize if that was confusing. Okay. I believe I said we were voting on whether to call the question. Voting to call the question, I know is terminology. Um, voting to call the question, voting to end debate. They mean the same thing, so. That is part of the terminology and um, I apologize if that was not clear. All right, we are now going to vote on the issue of whether or not the number of signatures. Uh, question please, uh, in the nature that Paul Warren asked yesterday, which is that if we vote, what we're voting to limit is only the number of signatures required on the special town meeting in November, the regular vote of signatures at annual town meeting will stay at 10, correct? There's no changing of that. Is that correct? No, this is on all. Thank you. Oh, yes, sorry. Thank you. Okay, right. So, uh, so this is, we are changing. Thank you very much for clarifying that. This is changing the number of votes required to put an article on the warrant for special town meetings 
increasing it um, on the original article to 50 signatures and under the amendment, increasing it to 25 signatures. Thank you for that clarification, Mr. Benzel. And we, I apologize for interrupting you. Um, so we vote on the amendment first. The amendment would increase the number from 10 to 25. If the amendment passes, it will then become integrated into the main motion. And if the main motion passes, then the rule will be that 25 signatures are required to file a petition in the, uh, in the special town meeting. If the 25, if the amendment fails, we will then proceed directly to the main motion requiring 50 signatures. If that passes, then that will apply to the special town meetings and 50 signatures will be required. If it fails, it will stay at 10 signatures. So first we are voting on the amended article. Again, found at pages 9.4 through 9.5 of the combined reports. And we are voting for a majority vote of whether to change the number of signatures required for special town meetings from 10 to 25 signatures. Wake up your tablets, get on the Zoom page, and we will drop the vote. You have 45 seconds. Um, point of order. What? It's not clear whether we're voting to change the number of votes from 10 to 50 on just November meeting or on all town meetings. Thank you. Okay, according to the language, Mr. Gordon, could you please get up and explain? Hold on. A, thank you, Mr. Fisher. Mr. Gordon, please get up and clarify the intention of your article. It's very important. The, the intention and the language of the motion is to increase the number of signatures required for special town meetings. So annual town meeting, it would stay at 10 signatures. This, this is the annual town meeting. It, it, so the, what you are saying. I'd be more than more than happy to ask town council to weigh in as to what the effect of passing this article would be on special town meetings and on annual town meetings. If he doesn't mind, if you don't mind asking him. Mr. Callanan, could you please come up to the podium? Please. I think I got it. <laughs> Oh, yes, it's a bug. The moderator will explain that the first thing we're voting on is an amendment that then changes the main motion. Yes. We keep saying we're voting to raise from 10 to 25. That's not what we're doing. We're voting to change the main motion from 50 to 25. It's an important. No, what we're I have my mic back, please. And I have my mic back. Bye. Okay, let me clarify. First, this motion applies only to special town meetings. The law requires that there be 10 signatures only for annual town meetings. So annual town meetings like this one, which occur every spring, which relate to the budget, cannot be changed. Every citizen petition 
only requires 10 signatures. Special town meetings to which this motion and article apply. The article seeks to change the requirement to 50. The amendment seeks to change the requirement to special town meetings to 25. So what we would first vote on is the amendment. Do you want to change the number to 25? No, no, it's, excuse me. The way, the way it works is that you vote, as I was explaining yesterday, and it's a complex rule, you vote on amendments first because the amendment then attaches to the original motion and gets incorporated into it. Because once you voted on the main motion and said, okay, it's 50, you can't go back and say, oh no, no, it's 25. So you take the amendment, which is a smaller motion, first vote on that and then incorporate it into the main motion. And if you like the main motion, you vote yes or no. So you still have the attempt to defeat any change in the number of uh, votes required and you can do that by defeating the amendment and defeating the main motion, whether amended or not. Okay. Do you still have a question, sir? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. My name is Michael Rubenstein. I'm a new town meeting member from Precinct 13. Uh, I have a yes or no question, okay. and that is, when the pop-up appears on our screen for the next vote, are we voting to amend the main motion or to change it so that it will require 25 votes for a special town meeting instead of the current main motion of 50 votes for no. town meeting? No, no. You are, well, you would be changing it to require 25 votes, which would then be incorporated in, into the main motion. It is currently, but if the effect would be yes, you'd be changing the main motion. Okay. It's 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 a it's a difference without it's a distinction without a difference. But you'd be you'd be so voting. So is the answer to my question yes or no? I'm trying. To yes, effectively okay. yes. This is what makes the law so much fun. So, and this is what makes being moderator so challenging and fun. Anyway, so we are now voting on the amendment offered by the advisory committee, which is to ask you if you want to change for special town meetings, the number of votes, excuse me, do not say anything while I am talking. You do not speak unless you are called upon. Unless you have something extremely important to say, sir, I want you to take your seat. Madam, did we, did, did we vote to shut off debate? Yes, we did. I didn't see any results, ma'am. Well, I announced them, please sit down. We are now voting on the amendment. The amendment asks you to vote on whether to amend the main motion and to change the requirement for special town meetings that petitioners obtain 25 signatures to file a citizen's petition rather than 10. So if you want 25 signatures in order to file a petition, you will vote yes on this. If you do not want 25 signatures, you vote no. Town council, have I accurately described this? And I do not want anyone to say anything. And if town council disagrees, he will explain what I have misstated. Joe Callanan, Town Council. Um, I'm going to try to explain it a different way. See if this this is helpful. 
The present requirement is 10 signatures. The warrant article as originally filed wanted to change that for special town meeting to 50. There's been an amendment that is now before you to change that 50 to 25. So the vote before you is only about special town meetings and the requirement of 25 signatures. Yes, it's the amendment of the main motion. You have to vote on this first. Do not argue with me. This is what we are voting on. Do you agree, town council? Yes, so I don't wanna hear any no's. If you don't want 25 signatures, don't vote yes. We will then vote on whether you want 50. Do not argue with me. Do not, I do not want to hear any no's. This is not debatable. Do you understand me, young woman who keeps saying no? You are not the moderator. You do not know the procedural rules. You do not understand them. I do not want you to say anything else. We are dropping the vote now. You will have 45 seconds. Okay, the amendment passes with 198 yes, 34 no, five abstentions. We will now vote on the main motion as amended. I want to say, you do not speak unless you are called on by the moderator. No one speaks. If anyone continues to interrupt me, you will be escorted out of the auditorium by one of the constables. I want to make that clear. I will not tolerate what I am seeing tonight. It is not acceptable behavior. Thank you. We are now going to vote on the main motion as amended. The main motion as amended asks you to vote on whether to require 25 signatures to file a citizen's petition in a special town meeting. This would change the requirement, which is currently 10 votes. Drop the vote, please. Okay, the motion fails, 111 yes, 120 no, six abstentions. This means that the requirement for the number of signatures on a citizen's petition remains at 10. Thank you very much. We are now turning to Article 10. Article 10 
seeks to change the bylaw 2.1.13 to require that citizen petitions identify one lead petitioner. It is found on page 10.4 to 10.5 of the combined reports. It is moved by Neil Gordon and seconded by Cliff Brown. According to my records, Mr. Gordon will give a speech in a minute, and I want to remind everyone of the admonition I just gave. And I think I made it clear that I was very serious about it. Mr. Gordon, you may proceed. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Neil Gordon, Precinct 1. As the number of Warren articles has expanded, another parallel trend has emerged. Where petition warrant articles were most often brought by a petitioner or two, we now see a proliferation of co-petitioners. Excluding the multiple counts of grouped warrant articles, a rough count of last fall's special town meeting showed at least 15 articles with multiple petitioners. Five had five or more co-petitioners, one had 11. For this May, the top two have eight and 10, co-petitioners. Hidden to many, perhaps, is the impact the practice of listing co-petitioners without a designated lead places on our boards, committees, and commissions, and on the town staff. Scheduling meetings and hearings is difficult and made more so when multiple, multiple petitioners are added to the mix. Further, the authority of one or more petitioners, one or another petitioner, to speak for the others is often less than clear, leading to further delays. This causes a delay in holding meetings and in the completion of reports to town meeting members. It's why one of the reasons we have so many blanks in the combined reports only do land in the supplement or in the aisles at town meeting. This compresses as well town meeting members' preparation for town meeting, as we've heard. And I'll suggest that the public may be as confused as the rest of us in knowing which petitioner they should contact about a particular warrant article. At a recent diversity commission meeting, a commissioner assigned to follow up on article 20 asked, is there etiquette on that? There are so many people listed. Article 10 proposes that every petitioned article designate a single lead petitioner. Designating a lead will create a single point of contact. It doesn't preclude collaboration or identification of co-sponsors or co-petitioners, call them what you may. I received several comments about broadening the requirement that the lead petitioner be a voter, which the moderator has ruled beyond the scope. To summarize, Article 10 is a small step toward making the work of the Select Board, Advisory Committee, town staff and others just a bit more efficient. It's intended to complement other small steps that are being taken to ease the burden on the select board and the other uh, town boards, committees, and commissions, and on town meeting members. I ask for a vote of favorable action on Article 10. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ananian. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Scott, C. Scott Nanian, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 10, opposing this article. Next slide. This warrant article has a fundamental misconception about the role of town residents in authoring and bringing forward warrant articles. There is no requirement in state law. Uh, five, I think you gave. John, give me five. Thanks. Oh, yes, he has five minutes. I apologize. Um, no worries. There is no requirement in state law that a resident that a resident be either a single person or a registered voter in order to originate or author a warrant article. In fact, the broad use of petitioner in our common usage obscures the actual provisions of state law. Uh, next slide. But this is how an article is brought to town meeting. Someone has a good idea. Someone, maybe not the same person, writes it down in the proper form. Ten registered voters have to agree with the idea. These are the petitioners. There is no requirement that they are either the originator nor the author of the warrant article but it has to have the support from 10 registered voters before it can um, be presented as a petition to the select board. 
Later, two town meeting members will need to move and second a motion under the article. Again, there is no requirement that the mover and second be either the petitioners, the originators, or the author of the motion. Next slide. This article concerns itself with the middle step when the advisory committee would like a single person to schedule hearings and present the case for the warrant article. We'll call this the lead for the article. This person need not be a petitioner. This person need not be the mover, the second, or even the author. There is no particular reason why that single person should have the authority to make unilateral changes or amendments to the motion moved at TM, um, even if the advisory committee would prefer that. Next slide. Let's look at some examples. Here are a number of recent articles brought by committees or groups. More Article 22 in this town meeting was brought by a committee, the Ranked Choice Voting Study Committee. Last fall, we had a number of articles brought by the Zero Admissions Advisory Board. In spring 2022, articles were brought by the CDICR, the Commission on Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Relations. In fall 2020, we had articles brought by a coalition of residents. In fall 2019, a number of green-oriented folks got together to bring Warren Article 31, the Joint Climate Resolution. In none of these cases was a single person the author or originator of the article or motions, although there may well have been a single contact person. Next slide. We've had articles brought by non-voters. Last spring, Warren Article 28. Uh, next slide. And Warrant Article 29 was brought by Jay Schweitzer Shallot, a non-voter, not registered voter due to age. He was both the originator, author, and primary proponent of these articles. He was not a registered voter. Next slide. Articles have been brought by the Girl Scouts and school groups. Girl Scout Troop 62558 brought Warrant Article 21 in fall of 2018. Rebecca Stone was the author of Warrant Article 20 in spring 2019, but the principal proponents were Brookline High School students. An article cited here, uh, down at the bottom, notes that residents can propose new bylaws. It's the great thing about Brookline. But note, they say residents, not registered voters, and lists four different tobacco control articles brought by Brookline High School students. Next slide. I attempted to amend this article to correct it, as shown. This attempt was not allowed due to scope. Next slide. Which is for the best, as even my attempted amendment did not fix another glaring flaw in this article, which is that Brookline's bylaw 10.3 states that if not subject to a specific penalty, each violation shall be subject to a specific penalty of $50. Do we really want to fine petitioners $50 for forgetting to fill out a field when they submit a warrant article? Next slide. To the extent that there is a need to identify a single contact point, there is no need for a bylaw. The select board office could just ask when they fill out the form and drop it off at the select board office, what is the contact person for this proposal? There's no need for this bylaw. It is hostile to residents. It is undisclosed financial penalties, and it misunderstands the fundamentally the relationship of petitioners to organizers and advocates. Attempts to amend this article were disallowed, and this all adds up for me to a recommendation of no action. Thank you. Cliff Brown. Cliff Brown, uh, advisory committee, meet, committee meeting member at law. Could you speak more loudly, please, Mr. Brown? Sure. Cliff Brown, advisory committee uh, member at large. Um, I do, before I start, just wanted to uh, point out that this article is about petitioned articles only. It is not about articles that are put forth by a board or commission, which a number of the articles uh, that uh, Mr. Nadian uh, referenced uh, were. Um, once again, there was broad appreciation on the advisory committee for the administrative goals of the petitioner in submitting this article. Uh, there wasn't a heck of a lot of discussion. Um, the discussion of the proposal focused on whether there were any specific penalties uh, for noncompliance. Uh, there were no specific penalties uh, in the article. There are none. And whether it would be possible to create an administrative rule instead of codifying the requirement into the law, into the bylaw. Um, as the rules for submitting an article are in the bylaw, the petitioner offered that it was appropriate that this requirement also be there. Uh, the advisory committee voted to recommend favorable action on Article 10 as offered by the petitioner by a vote of 19 in favor, one opposed, and no abstentions. Thank you. Mr. Sandman, can you please come?
Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, Mike Sandman, speaking for the select board, which voted uh, three to one uh, to recommend favorable action on warrant 10. In the debate that we just concluded, messy conclusion though it may have been, it was suggested that there were better ways to improve the workings of town meeting and the run up to town meeting than just requiring more signatures on warrant articles. Article 10 represents one of those ways. The committees that are required to review and report on warrant articles frequently have difficulty knowing which petitioners to coordinate with to schedule a hearing. Moreover, when the select board or the advisory committee want to propose an amendment, they need to know who amongst the petitioners, single or plural, has authority to act on the request. And when they receive an amendment from one of the petitioners, they want to know that the person making that amendment has the authority to speak for their co-petitioners. This is not a theoretical problem. As a former advisory committee chair, I assure you it's been a real one. And we've gotten amendments from members of a, uh, from one person uh, who uh, uh, is part of a group that submitted a petition and others in, the, in, in that group don't know anything about it. Uh, and uh, we may schedule something to try to deal with it, and then the whole thing comes apart, and uh, what appeared to be a conclusion has to be repeated. Um, so all of this leads to delays. It leads to extended uh, work by advisory committee subcommittees in particular. It leads to confusion on the part of the town committees that do this work. It leads to, commission, to confusion sometimes on the part of petitioners. And certainly, as we've heard, it leads to confusion and some considerable irritation on the part of town meeting members who may see a flurry of modifications in warrant articles as town meeting approaches and a further flurry during the meeting. And that is, I agree, a pain. Mr. Renanian has certainly given you the correct legal definition of petitioner, but it misses the whole point of the article. The advisory committee is just seeking a single name or perhaps a couple of names, a person with whom they can communicate to schedule the required hearing. That does seem quite reasonable. Please vote favorable action on Warren Article 10. Mr. Margolis. Uh, can we sure that, make sure that mic is on? Is that, okay. John Margolis, Precinct 7, and a library trustee. Uh, Justice Frankfurter once wrote that the history of liberty is in some sense the history of procedure. This is a procedural warrant article. It's meant to smooth the way in which warrant articles get worked on before they appear before us. It seeks to, to make things work better. New town meeting members and those of us who've been here for a while are aware that town meeting is, I hate to say it, frequently chaotic. The idea behind this article is to make it less chaotic. That seems to me to be a good thing. I suggest the thing to do is to vote favorable action on this article. Ms. Frawley. Regina Farali, town meeting member from Precinct 16. Yes, I agree with everything that John just said. I wanna personally and anecdotally say, I cannot tell you how many meetings I had to go to because I'm known for going to meetings that the committee and I, our time was wasted because the principal petitioner who had the greatest amount of knowledge didn't bother to show up, but the co-petitioners did. And when asked, to fill in, they didn't have the information. Sorry, I don't really know enough about this. I just put my name on it. That's really the kind of thing we're trying to stop because it wasted another evening. And the committees that I saw bent over backwards to hold a second meeting on that warrant article until the prime person could show up. So this is just an, a, a good governance, orderly procedural warrant article and I urge you to support it. Thank you. Hi, Carolyn Goodwin in Precinct 8. I just had a question. Um, I'm not as familiar with all the procedures here. I'm looking at the definitions, and it, when it says the lead petitioner to be a registered voter, and I'm curious, if do you need to be a registered voter 
to be, to bring a petition in general, or even to be a town meeting member. I'm just, I'm wondering if this, if this is sort of a, a new definition that's inserted here or not. Does that makes sense. Like, I would think it might just be, you know, a citizen, not a citizen even, but a member of the town or, or a eligible voter or something like that. Mr. Gordon. Neil Gordon, Precinct 1, and lead petitioner of Warren Article 10. Uh, to petition a Warren Article for town meeting requires the signatures of registered voters in the town of Brookline. That is the law in Brookline. Uh, what I define in drafting the Warren Article and in the motion is a definition of lead petitioner that suggests that one of those registered voters signing the petition is designated as the lead petitioner. It does not have to be a signer, uh, but it does need to be a registered voter. Madam moderator, if I could comment on the notion of non-voters, um, th there was a motion, uh, an amendment offered at the advisory subcommittee that would have removed the voter requirement, the registered voter requirement for lead petitioner. Uh, I agreed to that. The advisory subcommittee agreed. The moderator ruled that out of scope. Uh, the notion, on the other hand, that anyone be designated as a lead petitioner. Yes, we've had interested and interesting articles uh, brought by high school students. The uh, suggested amended language would allow uh, anyone designated, a third grader, a first grader, a kindergartner, right? That is not how we run our government. Thank you. Yes. Hi, <clears throat> Jeffrey Benson, Precinct 3. So I have a, a compromise suggestion because we do know that requiring people to be registered voters has been so long used as a barrier to let non-registered voters be participants in our community. And because the lead petitioner had wanted that to be put into it, it didn't have to be a registered voter, and so did everyone else, but we're stuck because it was out of the scope. I, my suggestion is we vote this down because it's so flawed and ask Mr. Gordon or others to bring it back next time and take that registered voter part out. That way we're not stuck with a bad warrant article. There's no emergency that we have to do this in the next few months, rather than voting in something that restricts so many people from being the leads, we don't need to do it right now. So that's my suggestion, vote this down, please bring it back and just take out the registered voter, thank you. Hi, Connor Sheehan, town meeting member of Precinct 10. Um, this seems like a plain sense thing to have a single point of contact. Anyone who's interested in like efficient organizations, that's like a, that's a thing you usually do, like deadlines and next steps. It's like one of those things you do. So conceptually, it makes sense. What I didn't understand, I think I heard earlier that there was a question about whether or not this can just be an administrative rule and that the petitioner preferred that it wasn't and that they wanted to do a bylaw. I, I don't really care about preference. Can it just be an administrative rule? Can we just do this more simply? Or do we really have to vote this to make this happen? And if we can, why wouldn't we? Good evening, uh, Scott Gladstone, Precinct 16. Earl? Oh, uh, I would actually, like that. I would, that would be good. I'm going to address that to the town administrator. Thank you. Chas Carey, town administrator. Wait. Chas Carey, town administrator. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. After that, uh, Mr. Sandman has made a motion to call the question, and it has been seconded by Ms. Ashkenazi. Um, we will now take a vote on whether or not to end debate 
on this Article 10, which would require a uh, pass a bylaw to require the identification on a citizen petition of a lead petitioner who is a registered voter. We are now voting to close debate, which requires a two thirds majority. The motion to call the question and end debate passes with 190 yes, 33 no, and six abstentions. We will now vote on the merits of the article itself. A yes vote would require that any citizen petition filed identify one lead petitioner who is a registered voter. A no vote would not change the current requirement, which is to not identify such one lead petitioner. We will now vote. It is a majority vote. We will we have 45 seconds to vote. The motion fails, it's 93 yes, 93, 131 no and 13 abstentions. We now move on to Article 11. Article 11 is an article to modify the bylaw to require the relating to requiring the uh, select board and the advisory committee or an AC subcommittee to have at least one public hearing on each article and for the select board to make a recommendation on report on each article. And if it makes no recommendation to give the reasons for that with certain categories being given preference. The motion is found on the pink supplement number two, pages three through four. The motion is made by Mr. Dick Benka and seconded by Neil Gordon. First presentation will be made by Mr. Benka and Mr. Jones, Sean Lynn Jones. They will have 10 minutes to divide between them.
Thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. I'm Sean Lynn Jones, Precinct 1, speaking for the Committee on Town Organization and Structure, CTONS. CTONS member uh, Dick Banka will also be speaking. We're dividing our 10 minutes. CTONS is the petitioner for Article 11, and the committee unanimously recommends favorable action on the motion offered by the advisory committee. In the, the very bright pink supplement, if you have the uh, hard copy, if not, if you're looking online, it's Article 11, Supplement Number 2, and that's where the full language of the motion, redlined and clean copy, is available. And if you are interested in the report of the committee, it's the blue supplement, Article 11, Supplement 1. For those of you who are new, and maybe those some of the, you who are not, I'd like to say what CTONS is, because you might not have heard much about the committee. It's a seven-member committee appointed by the moderator, and it generally consists of members who have much experience in town government. For example, we have four former advisory committee chairs, two former select board members, one of whom served as chair, and one former school committee on the uh, uh, CTOS, CTONS currently. And we're responsible for looking at questions of organization and structure, whether they're referred to us, or whether we take the initiative to uh, examine them because they're in the warrant, or even if they're not. I'll briefly try to summarize Article 11. It's a response to the problem of too many warrant articles, too little time. It's a bylaw amendment that gives the select board more flexibility in deciding to, when to offer recommendations on warrant articles and providing some guidelines on the kinds of articles that the select board should offer recommendations on. Uh, it also is about the, in, it also would tighten up the requirement that public hearings be held on all warrant articles and do a few other things. Um, it's mainly about the kind of information the town meeting, that's you, will receive on warrant articles as you review them and vote on them. It sets up a long-term, realistic, and feasible framework for dealing with the problem of too many warrant articles in too little time. It confronts both the select board and the advisory committee. Uh, and so you have a particular interest in how this process works. Briefly, in the last few years, last five years, we've seen a 50% increase in the average number of articles per town meeting. Uh, in those five years, it's been 38. Between 2001 and 2017, it was about 25. Uh, this town meeting, including the special town meeting, has 26 articles. That may be a new trend, or maybe it's an outlier. We don't know yet. We'll have to wait and see. But certainly in recent years, there have been lots of articles. The select board had an experiment, a pilot program last year at both town meetings, when it decided it just would not make recommendations on articles that it chose not to make recommendations on. It recommended on about half or two thirds when it did that. It submitted Article 5 to the November town meeting to remove the bylaw requirement, which uh, some people said it had been ignoring, to delete the word all uh, when it comes to making recommendations on warrant articles. Town meeting, by about a two-thirds vote, referred that to CTO and ONS, and we have been working on that steadily ever since with many meetings and hearings. Article 11 is the result. What it does and why. Well, here's the brief summary. Number one, it would relieve the, the select board of the responsibility to offer recommendations on all warrant articles. It does that by simply inserting the words, if any, after recommendation. Uh, there are some warrant articles where the select board's recommendation might not be essential to town meeting. For example, articles, resolutions on US foreign policy or resolutions calling for the impeachment of the president. Uh, there are, however, and this is the second key thing this article does, at least five categories of articles that we thought were very important and the select board should give priority on making recommendations on these categories if it couldn't deal with every single article in a long warrant. Articles submitted by the select board itself or a town department or commission, articles that request action by the state legislature, amend a bylaw, enter into a binding agreement, or appropriate funds. These are all objective. These are not just pertain to or could possibly either you appropriate funds you don't. Why these? Number one, sometimes the select board has the responsibility for putting this article on the warrant. So it should explain to town meeting what's going on and what it feels about it. Second, the select board knows a lot and has access to excellent staff with information. It's the executive branch, and they would be great if they would share their opinions on bylaws that they have to implement and administer and appropriations where there may or may not be funds available. And sometimes, this is a third reason why these five categories are important, the select board has the responsibility to specifically implement an article, for example, by filing a home rule uh, petition. 
The article also tightens up the requirement that there be a public hearing on every single warrant article. The current bylaw has a loophole. It says there should be a public hearing before a vote is taken. But what if there is no vote? What if the select board simply decides not to review a, water, a warrant article at all? Uh, that is something where we think there should be a public hearing. Public hearings are great for the public to provide input, for the select board to learn a little bit about what kind of debate's gonna come up on a warrant article. And we've had some articles that look completely non-controversial, and then the public hearing revealed a lot of people had concerns. Uh, finally, uh, the warrant article, when it comes to section 2.52 of the bylaw, makes that, as it pertains to the advisory committee, consistent with what town meeting voted in 2020. And that is to give the advisory committee much more flexibility, which it hasn't really exercised so far in deciding whether to make uh, recommendations on warrant articles or not. It's basically a housekeeping amendment. The uh, article also changes the period before the annual town meeting, that's the May town meeting, between the closing of the warrant and the first night of the town meeting from 75 days to 90 days. Why? Well, there's an obviously ma mathematical reason. If you have 50% more warrant articles in the same amount of time, your work gets very compressed. It's hard to schedule. At least let's try to have a little bit more time. We're not trying to reduce the number of warrant articles. I think this town meeting has decided not to require more signatures. Let there be more warrant articles if that's the way it is. But if that's the case, allow more time. Uh, 90 days is about as far out as you could go because you start overlapping your town meeting periods. If you go much beyond that. Uh, it's particularly challenging for the advisory committee, which is also reviewing all the budget articles with hearings and getting into those in great detail, to have only 75 days, 90 days seemed reasonable. Uh, the advisory committee amended our original motion so that the 90 days is only for the annual town meeting, which usually has lots of warrant articles and the budget. Uh, we agreed with that, and CTONS supports the advisory committee motion. And I'll point out there are some concerns that when there's a new governor, the budget's later, et cetera, the flexibility that's on, in the bylaw already for the select board to waive these requirements still exists, and the select board can also convene a special town meeting within the special town meeting, or citizens can initiate that, as has happened on the guns article within this annual town meeting. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dick Benka. We'd be happy to answer questions later. And uh, again, we are recommending favorable action on the advisory committee motion. Thank you very much. Dick Benka, Precinct 14, speaking for CTO and S. First, there's a simple technical amendment to bylaw section 3.22. This applies to committees other than the advisory committee and the select board. The change simply means that these town committees must hold a public hearing if they are going to make a recommendation or a report the town meeting. But if they are simply voting not to make a recommendation to town meeting, they do not have to hold a public hearing. Now let me turn to the select board objections on page 11-15 of the combined reports to the proposed changes regarding bylaw section 2.52, dealing with public hearings and recommendations by the select board. The select board says that they want a quote, simplified solution, unquote, to the increased number of warrant articles. Their solution proposed to the November 2022 town meeting would have given the board complete discretion on which articles to make recommendations. That certainly is simplified, but it, in the view of CTONS, it's not adequate. It's not adequate to fulfill the structural role of the select board as the town's elected executive body with direct access to significant information possessed by town department. And it's not adequate to fulfill the practical role of the select board as the one body with regularly scheduled and televised public hearings where warrant articles can be vetted and the public can be informed. And as for the burden, town council has made clear that the select board has the authority to limit the time given to public hearings. 
The select board now argues that, quote, with a change in leadership, they have reverted back to the prior system of reviewing all articles, unquote, and that a change, therefore, and therefore ensuring public hearings, quote, may not be necessary, unquote. But that's not an adequate answer. I trust that the board, this board, will not waver in its promises, but this board will not be with us forever. And town council has given the green light for any future select board to revert to the prior practice of not reviewing significant warrant articles. Why is that the case? An example. At the September 2022 select board meeting, the board spent 58 minutes going through all of the articles on the warrant for the November 2022 town meeting. These included the nine ZEB articles that dealt with significant but the significant issue of climate change. And that sought home rule legislation, new bylaws, and new taxes and fees. 58 minutes discussing and identifying the articles they wanted to hear, ultimately eliminating 16. Only then did they open the public hearing. The public hearing lasted three minutes and seven seconds. One person spoke and she said the select board was violating the bylaw. The deputy town administrator then stated that town council had okayed that procedure. And then the select board closed the public hearing and formally voted not to consider 16 articles already identified, including eight of nine ZEAB articles. That was okayed as an adequate public hearing before the final vote of the select board. Three minutes and seven seconds, no proponents, no opponents for 16 articles to disappear, to disappear from the select board's agenda. That is what would be okayed under the existing bylaw for any future select board. That's why a no action vote would be misguided and why the advisory committee and CTONS proposals should be approved. Thank you. Mr. Sandman. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Mike Sandman uh, speaking for the select board, uh, which unanimously, I believe, yes, voted four to nothing to recommend no action on Article 11. Uh, this article comes to us as a result of an article we offered last November's town meeting, asking that the select board be allowed to not hold hearings and making recommendations on warrant articles under certain defined circumstances. Um, and there are articles on which the select board opinion has very little purpose. Twice in my time at town meeting, we've been asked to endorse trade with Cuba. The first time was, what was uh, uh, about eight or nine years ago when Fidel Castro was still alive. I was an advisory committee member and was assigned to chair an ad hoc committee to hold a hearing. And despite my efforts, Mr. Castro refused to attend. Um, the second time was just last November. That, uh, that was offered by someone who knew about the earlier motion which by the way had passed. In 2017, we had an article to ask our members of Congress to impeach Donald Trump. And as usual, Brookline was way ahead of the curve, that passed. So just the same, despite the merit of these articles, there's no merit in the select board dealing with them. Uh, I think the select board and I think the advisory committee both struggle with a singularly heavy workload. The advisory committee focuses in depth on the warrant, especially on the budget. While the select board does not go as deep and it has to sandwich hearings and votes on warrant articles uh, into its regular workload without missing a beat on matters that we deal with on a weekly basis. So we were asking under defined circumstances as opposed to on a whim, uh, and I accept uh, Mr. Benka's commentary about uh, the rather cavalier way in which uh, we dealt with this in November of uh, 2016. Sorry, 2022. Um, the article that we submitted was referred to the Committee on Town Organization and Structure, CTONS, its members, 
Uh, like uh, Mr. Lynn Jones and Mr. Benka are appointed by the moderator. They are typically former advisory committee chairs and former select board members, people who have a great deal of experience in town affairs. We are hopeful that CTONS would see the wisdom of allowing us, for example, to appoint two member subcommittees to hear and report on warrant articles that the select board as a whole agreed would not need a hearing by the entire board. CTONS did not see the wisdom of that approach. The article they submitted provides some relief to the advisory committee, but not to the select board, and our hopes were dashed. Please vote no on Article 11. Thank you. Mr. Gordon. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Neil Gordon, Precinct 1, speaking for the Advisory Committee. Article 11 was petitioned by the Committee on Town Organization and Structure in response to a select board plea, as you've heard, for too many articles, too little time. In a questionable experiment, the select board began reviewing some, but not all, town meeting articles. They brought so-called Article 5 in November 2022 in an effort to codify that practice. The impetus for Article 11 was town meeting's referral of Article 5 to CTONS with a request to consider amending the relevant bylaws and reporting to town meeting no later than now. We thank the members of CTONS for their work and their timely response, bringing the subject matter of a town meeting referral back to town meeting in just six months. We town meeting need reports and recommendations from both the advisory committee and the select board. Without the combined reports, virtually, uh, virtual or otherwise, and it's called combined for a reason, we can't effectively conduct town meeting business. We especially need the town's executive, the body responsible for executing the work that we do here, to do two things. We need them to listen to the public and we need them to speak to us. In that regard, Article 11 provides the select board with a workable framework it satisfies the public's right to be informed and to be heard, and it satisfies the need of town meeting to know and understand the select board's position on warrant articles that impact the town. Where the select board concludes an article doesn't impact the town, their report needs say no more than that. Separately, advancing the closing date of the warrant for our annual town meeting as recommended by CTONS and the advisory committee gives the select board more time to do the important work embodied in the provision of the proposed bylaw. By a vote of 23 in favor, three opposed, and with one abstention, the advisory committee recommends favorable action on Article 11. Mr. Anani, and I see you waiting. However, I'm going to allow Mr. Lynn Jones uh, to speak first because I think he has a point of I have a, a factual correction Thank which you. may or not be a point of order and several other factual corrections which again may or not be points of order but I'm Sean Lynn Jones precinct one a uh, member of the committee on town organization and structure uh, my first uh, factual correction I, I'm afraid I, I have to direct to uh, Mr. Gordon on the advisory committee uh, who reported the vote as 23 to 3 to 1 the very bright pink supplement indicates that the vote was unanimous, 24 to 0 to 0, uh, as was the vote of the Committee on Town Organization and Structure for favorable action on the advisory committee motion. Um, Mr. Sandman stated that the motion does not give any relief to the select board, but it does to the advisory committee. That is exactly wrong and reversed. All this motion does, this uh, article, is to, for the advisory committee, take exactly the language the town meeting voted in 2022 in section 2.26, which pertains to the advisory committee, and put that language into section 2.52, which pertains to the combined reports. So there would be no difference at all in the requirements for when the advisory committee has to make reports and recommendations and on which articles. So uh, it was just, expressing the will of town meeting and ironing out that inconsistency. That's why I said it was a housekeeping amendment. But this does, this motion does say that the select board does not have to make recommendations on all articles. 
Uh, that's why we put the words, if any, in there to make it clear. But in some cases, there would be no recommendations. Uh, and that was fine. And that's relieving the burden on the select board compared to the current uh, bylaw. Uh, Mr. Sandman also said that there were you know, specific defined circumstances under which the um, select board would not make recommendations on articles. If you look at the text of Article 5 from the November 2022 special town meeting, it simply deleted the word all, opening it up to being some, none, or any articles on which the select board would be required to make recommendations. When the select board went through the process of uh, this uh, pilot program or experiment, it did have criteria which it communicated to CTRNS through the chair in a meeting and also to then, uh, well, Mr. Gadsby and an email from the chair of the select board. And for example, one of those criteria was the select board would consider articles that were controversial. I think that's subjective and uncertain. And as we saw, for those of you who remember, with the ZAB articles that Mr. Benkin mentioned, those were probably the most controversial articles we've had in years, yet the select board did not make recommendations or hold hearings on almost all of them. So uh, I'm just puzzled by all of that, and I think there are clear factual inconsistencies that I feel compelled to report, and I'm sorry to go on at such length, but I thank you for your indulgence. Thank you, and I apologize that, that I know you want to say something, Mr. Sandman, but unless Mr. Ananian seats his place, I, I, I am going to. I seat my place. Okay. <laughs> so, um, first of all, um, I do want to repeat what I said at the podium, that um, the select board recognizes that, uh, well, I didn't say exactly this, but uh, I did say that we had uh, given two cursory uh, and uh, uh, a look at the Warren articles in uh, uh, last November, and uh, I think we've learned from that. Uh, during the hearings that uh, CTO and us had, we did make some suggestions about specific measures that we felt um, would give us some flexibility, uh, and those are not in the, uh, the Warren article, and indeed that is why we are asking for no action. Mr. Ananian. Thank you, Madam Moderator. I see Harry Friedman is at the podium. I meant to thank him for his kind words earlier. Um, Scott Nanian, town meeting member, uh, Precinct 10, in opposition to this Warren article. The advisory committee seems to be actively against efforts to increase the efficiency of the Warren article review and town meeting process, preferring to erect new barriers to entry against community participation in government rather than streamlining their processes. This Warren article requires the advisory committee to have public hearings for all articles, even those with no financial impact or relevant advisory committee expertise and attempts to micromanage the select board warrant article review process, as you have heard the select board themselves state. It adds the requirement of a public hearing to all committee votes on reports or recommendations, even routine ones to accept friendly amendments or to correct Scrivener's errors. It also moves the opening and closing of the warrant even further from the start of town meeting. The late timing of town meeting is already a serious issue that prevents prompt hiring of personnel and adds employment uncertainty to town and school employees. We feel that moving the warrant submission further back in time is moving in the wrong direction. The Committee on Town Organization and Structure has managed to convert a proposed efficiency measure by the select board into an article which adds further time and unnecessary burden to warrant article reviews, affecting not only the select board, but also advisory and indeed every other committee in town and burdens petitioners with earlier deadlines as well. We recommend no action. Thank you. I'm sorry, when you say we, to whom are you referring? Sorry, this was a, a recommendation of Naomi Schweitzer and myself, uh, both precinct members, uh, town meeting members for Precinct 10. Thank you, Ms. Ashkenazi. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Miriam Ashkenazi, select board member. This is anything but a housekeeping amendment. So I think that let's be real clear here. We're taking a Warren article review process. We're saying, oh, the select board doesn't have to review every Warren article, but if you don't review it, we need a report on why you're not reviewing it. So essentially we are reviewing every Warren article. I think that's really important to point out because what we asked for was some relief. I will remind you all that I am a full-time day job, that I have two kids and I do this because I think it's really important work but help me out folks, we need some efficiency in this system and this is anything but that. Thank you, please vote no action. Mr. Friedman. Harry Friedman, uh, Precinct 12, Vice Chairman of the Advisory Committee 
and I'm going to have to disagree once again with my friend, Mr. Ananian. Um, this is a good government measure. It requires the select board to hold public hearings on the warrant articles. It's before the select board that townspeople regularly go in order to be heard on warrant articles. They know the select board meets every Tuesday night. They know it'll be televised. Um, these, uh, they might get more bang for their buck by going to the advisory subcommittee meetings, but people don't show up for those as much. They expect to go to the select board and be heard. Second of all, I spoke earlier this evening to oppose the warrant article that required uh, more signatures on, on warrant articles. I thought it was anti-democratic and would actually not do anything to lessen the load on the advisory committee. However, this warrant article does lessen the load on the advisory committee because in the Springtown meeting, it gives us 15 more days to review warrant articles, which we can use and we can need. I urge favorable action on this. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Khan, I'm gonna call on Ms. Frawley just because she was there first. Ms. Frawley. Regina Frawley, Price, a town meeting member from 16 and the original author of the warrant article that everybody's trying to change, the, that became a bylaw. I'm known by most people who are in here at least 10 years. I care more than anybody I know about public participation in the process, accountability and transparency. And that's why I spent months working on various warrant articles that previous town meetings voted to approve. The I sat there the night that a chair of the board of selectmen said, we're not going to do this. We're, we're just, I'm going to decide which one we vote on. And the majority of people sitting there didn't say peep about it. So they're just as culpable as the chair. And as a result, as Zeb was pointed out, it things have cut, gotten into the cracks. You who have voted tonight about grassroots speaking, you didn't get a chance to speak at these articles. This warrant article, even amended, absolutely allows you to make sure that they're doing their job and you get a chance to speak about things that matter to you. Vote yes. Thank you. Ms. Khan? Janice Khan, town meeting member from Precinct 15 and a member of the advisory committee. And I'd like to add another dimension to this debate, which is that this article is not really about the advisory committee and the select board. It's about the town of Brookline. And, and it really works for petitioners who go on vacation and need extra time for us to schedule meetings to hear their petitioned articles, because we do care on doing it right and listening and making sure that we get it right. So it really benefits all the petitioners who want their articles um, heard and brought to, you know, brought to town meeting in a way that, that gives it the best chance for passage here, which I'm sure petitioners want when they come to town meeting. And also just to phrase what um, my colleague, um, Harry said on, about um, the televised board meetings, we don't have town newspapers anymore. We have now a digital one, which is good. It's not gonna meet the needs of every town meeting member in, I mean, every resident in the town, but, um, but this is our, in effect, this is a newspaper that people can watch and listen to and see. And if they want to come and debate issues or come before the select board, that's an option but it also just gives them, it's a visual newspaper for us. We need to know what's going on in the town. This, um, the televised select board meetings really are an invaluable service and thank you to, to Big for, for doing this for the town. Honestly, I don't know how we would have gone through the last three years without it, but as life normalizes perhaps, let fewer and fewer meetings may be on Zoom. And that means that this board's work will be ever so much more important. And so I urge all of us to stand behind this article and vote favorable action. Thank you. Ms. Stone. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Rebecca Stone, Precinct, uh, Precinct 3, town meeting member. Um, uh, 
Ms. Khan and Mr. Ananian both mentioned petitioners on behalf of those of us who occasionally bring um, articles to town meeting. We know what this would move the ending of the warrant back to, but that can somebody please tell us how that will affect the opening of the warrant and the timing of the warrant for petitioners who may be submitting. Okay, Mr. Callanan or Mr. Carey, which one of you would like to address this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ms. Goss. Oh. <laughs> she is the woman with all the answers. Melissa Goff, Deputy Town Administrator. Melissa Goff, Deputy Town Administrator. Um, we did talk about the timing of the opening and closing of the warrant. Um, this would just be applying for special town meetings. So I think that the, um, well, the, I'd have to look at the language again. Just Actually, is that loud enough? Can everybody hear Ms. Goff? Yes. Okay. So it's, it's just the annual town meeting that would be affected and um, it would likely mean that the warrant would be closing in uh, the, at the end of February as opposed to uh, opening at the uh, at the closing at the end of February, um, which we expressed some concerns about the timing with the budget, but we would be able to deal with that with a by calling a special town meeting. So um, a, a few weeks earlier than we would normally, um, probably around February vacation would be um, how it would be impacted. Okay, we have uh, two people waiting. Um, I'm going to let them speak and then I will entertain the motion to call the question. Yes, could you please identify yes. yourself? Yes, I'm Carol Hillman, town meeting member from precinct one. Um, if the select board is looking to make economies of time, I would suggest that they no longer vote on liquor licenses for bar mitzvahs and weddings and also also that they perhaps leave it to the senior managers in each department uh, to approve the hiring of positions that have already been budgeted for i would hope that would give you at least a bit of relief thank you thank you yes We're required by bylaw and or state law to approve those licenses and uh, hire. Uh, we have hiring and firing authority, which the town administrator does not. Town manager would. Thank you. Yes, sir. Clint Richmond, Precinct 6. I don't know how we got here, but I feel like something that started maybe simple. It's gotten very complicated. It's so confusing. Uh, I'm going to vote no. I, I think CTNS needs to start over. Uh, extending the, the period to 90 days as a petitioner is longer. It's more work for us because now we have to be available for nights on 90 day period. Uh, I don't think that's practical. You know, we're give, if we give the select board more time, it doesn't change their workload. I think this goes back to some, a question that's been much debated here too, that we're not paying our select board. There's so many issues wrapped up in this. And I, I really feel like CTNS has managed to mess this up. So I'm going to vote no action. Okay, we have the motion to call the question. Uh, it. Could I? No, no. Is it allowed no, personal privilege me, to Ms. defend? Frawley, Ms. Frawley, personal please, privilege. Ms. Frawley, please sit down. Personal privilege. Ms. Frawley, beats is, anything. You know that. Okay. Parliamentary what procedure. Is, what is your point of personal privilege, and please make it a correct one. I hope it is because I'm offended on behalf of the CTOS. They are amongst the most hardworking, knowledgeable people who are less politicized of almost any board I know. And it's really just plain demeaning to call them as incompetent or they need to go back. They've held many, many meetings on this. I actually, uh, to the extent that the reputation of CTNS was impugned in any way, I agree. Thank you. All right, we will now call the question, which will, which has been seconded. We are now going to vote on whether or not to close debate. It will require a two thirds vote. Wait, we just, oh, okay. Okay, we are now going to vote on the CTOS 
uh, motion. Apparently, there's nobody waiting, so we don't need to call the question. We took care of that. So we are now going to vote on motion Article 11, which is the CTOS motion on the pink supplement, pages three, four, which had been moved by Mr. Benka, seconded by Mr. Gordon. The motion would fundamentally require the select board and the AC or an AC subcommittee to have at least one public hearing on each article and for the select board to make recommendations and a report on each article. And if there is no recommendation to give reasons therefore, and uh, there are certain categories which are specified for which would be given preference, such as uh, bylaw changes or where the town is entering into binding agreements. This vote requires a majority to pass. And we will hold the vote now. Make sure your machines are awake and not asleep and that you are on the Zoom voting page. The motion passes 135 yes, 90 no, 11 abstentions. Okay, we now move on to Article 12. Article 12 is found on page 12-3 of the combined reports. It is brought by Mr. Lebowitz and seconded by Mr. Toffel. The article seeks to require changes relating to outside auditors and lead partners and seeks requirements relating to changes, which I will allow Mr. Levitz to describe to you. Mr. Levitz and Toffel, you have a combined six minutes. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Alec Levitz, Town Meeting yeah, Member, Precinct okay, 8. Not. Okay, can we address the feedback, please? That better? Oh, beautiful. Okay. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Alec Lebovitz, Town Meeting Member, Precinct 8. Good evening, everyone. I'm here as a petitioner of Warren Article 12, along with my co-petitioner, Mike Toffel. Warren Article 12 seeks to establish an audit rotation policy in our bylaws as part of a broader ongoing effort to identify and adopt financial and management best practices in Brooklyn. Next slide, please. Why should town meeting consider adopting an audit rotation policy? Well, the town is required by state law to conduct an annual audit each year of our finances. This is a critical process that helps the town measure our fiscal position and identify and manage potential present and future financial risks. Our audits are also used by credit rating agencies to gauge Brookline's fiscal integrity and resilience. For over 20 years, Brookline has retained the same audit firm and the majority of those years, the same audit partner has been assigned to lead our annual audit. While no specific issues have been identified with our audit during this period, having only one firm and one partner review our finances for such a long period carries with it inherent risks. This was reflected in the 2020 report of the Brookline Fiscal Advisory Committee, or BFAC. One of BFAC's recommendations was that the town improve its long-standing financial, or long-term rather, financial risk management by adopting an audit rotation policy. Next slide, please. Audit rotation policies typically require periodic changes in an organization's external audit firm, the lead partner assigned to their audit, or both. Rotation policies have risen to prominence, particularly over the last two decades, 
as a financial best practice for large organizations, including municipalities. This is because regular audit rotation ensures that a truly independent evaluation of our finances will occur at a regular basis, minimizing risks that could arise from the complacency of a long-term incumbent firm or partner. Again, no specific issues have been found with our current firm, but fresh eyes on our finances and a regular cadence provide us with added security and improve the rigor of our financial management practices. Next slide, please. Auto rotation is increasingly being adopted throughout the US and globally as it gains recognition as a best practice for large organizations. This began in 2002 in the United States with the passage of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act by Congress, mandating that large public, publicly traded US firms rotate their audit firms every five to seven years. States have also begun to adopt this measure as policy, beginning with California in 2013, which passed a state law mandating that all municipalities in California rotate their lead audit partners every six years. The EU has similarly recently promulgated regulations requiring all public interest entities to rotate their audit firms every 10 years. Just a small measure of the scope of adoption of audit rotation globally. Next slide, please. For context, this slide provides a brief history of the proposed policy you will vote on tonight. This began in the 2020 BFAC report with their initial recommendation. The Select Board and Audit Committee did consider this recommendation, but ultimately did not adopt such a policy at the time. And in fact, they chose to extend the contract with the current audit firm for an additional three years. In 2021, the Audit Committee did request that our lead audit partner be rotated, but they stopped short of adopting a formal policy. Warren Article 12 was introduced earlier this year in March, and to give town meeting the opportunity to take action on this recommendation by BFAC and implement a rotation policy. The petitioners then worked with the audit committee to implement a rotation policy and further operationalize our proposal. Ultimately, last month, the audit committee did vote to adopt an internal policy that matches the contents of Warren Article 12. However, we still feel that adopting this in our bylaws is warranted, and for more on this, I'll pass it over to my co-petitioner. Uh, next slide, please. Mike Toffel, uh, town meeting member, Precinct 8. So let me briefly take you through uh, what the article proposes. It proposes three elements. One is that we require the rotation of the lead auditor uh, every so they can't work for us for more than five consecutive years. The second is it limits the term of the length of the contract to five years, providing more flexibility to the town should they decide they're not satisfied with the auditor. And third, it directs the finance department to undertake a procurement process every 10 years. They can still rehire the same audit firm if they wish, but it requires them to go get some additional proposals. Um, and with the suggestion of the audit committee, we extended, we allowed a two year additional a time period here for unforeseen circumstances like the next pandemic. Next slide, please. So here's what the, here's what the uh, amendment says. Uh, let me take you through it, the three parts. Next slide, please. Okay, so the first part, uh, sorry, the first, yes. No individual can serve as lead auditor for more than five consecutive years. Uh, next slide, please. B states a contract can only be as much as five years. Next slide, please. And finally, Again, competitive bids or an alternative procurement method every 10 years, allowing a two-year extension. Uh, next slide. So since the audit committee already adopted our proposal after we finally, finally, after we filed it, why do we still need a bylaw? Well, the audit committee can change their mind and it only takes three votes for them to do so. We think this is a fundamental notion that town meeting should enshrine in our bylaws so that we ensure we get strong audits of and fresh eyes on our books. Uh, the select board still has no audit policy, so audit rotation policy, so they could choose to ignore the audit committee if they chose. Only a bylaw is the way to ensure that these important best practices are put and insisted upon our government. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, one last slide. Okay, so uh, tell you where everyone stands. So the audit committee voted in favor of our bylaw. The advisory committee by a wide majority did so as well. And the majority of select board members did as well. They voted 2-2 before the most recent election. Paul Warren joined subsequently, agrees with us. This is a common sense notion and also is supportive. Thank you very much.
Mr. Green. Thank you, uh, Madam Moderator. Bernard Green, Chair of the Select Board. Uh, first of all, uh, personal, um, not privilege, but I'd like to just note that in the audience, we have someone whose birthday is today, and that's uh, a, a longtime town meeting member, uh, Roger Lipson. And I'd like to give him a, a round of applause. I think we all, or most of us know Roger and, and his uh, son, uh, Andy Lipson, who was our police chief uh, a few years ago. So, okay. First of all, uh, we did not vote uh, for uh, the uh, um, audit rotation, uh, even though Paul Warren came on and said that he would be in favor of it. That is not a vote. So the uh, position of the select board is um, no recommendation, having voted two to two for no action and two to two for favorable action. Um, and I'm going to try to give people a sense of the different sides of that debate um, uh, in, in a second. So the proposed uh, originated, proposal originated with the uh, Brookline Fiscal Advisory Committee, which had a number of recommendations, some of which we adopted and some of which we did not uh, as a select board and as other bodies in town. Um, unfortunately, the fact that we didn't accept everything uh, was not something that some people appreciated. And I think that, you know, maybe this is part of it. The original proposal imposed, the original proposal imposed an explicit mandate to change audit firms every 10 years and change partners every five years. The audit committee adopted the rotation of partners as um, I, I think um, the level which I mentioned, um, I think it's last year. And our long time and very effective lead partner, Craig Peacock, was replaced by the equally effective name partner, Jim Power. The manager on the engagement, uh, Andreas Tejeda, uh, remained on the team. Just so that you don't think that I'm just giving you a uh, biased view of this issue, I'm going to read from page 12-4, and I have four minutes, so I can do this. Um, the different uh, uh, discussions uh, or different issues raised by select board members. Select board debated the merits of Article 12 with two members expressing criticism that the article stemmed from a lack of trust and by passing a town meeting would impose regulations on a process that is ultimately the responsibility of the select board and town administrator, appointed leadership in the finance department and the town's audit committee. It goes on a little bit more. I'll jump over that and get to the, uh, the argument in favor. Board members in support of Article 12 expressed opposing sentiments, arguing that auditors may become too comfortable and a given client with a given client over time. They further express that Article 12 does not mandate a change in the auditor's firm, only, only the lead partner in charge of the audit at a given firm, and it would be fiscally, fiscally responsible to, at a minimum, seek bids or proposals on a 10-year basis, uh, even if the town is not mandated. So I say that just so you don't think that I'm giving you a biased viewpoint of here. I want to note that some of the um, reasons, the original proposal, not the current one, but the original proposal was problematic in my view, some of which are still applicable. There are probably just four firms, according to our finance director, that are willing to and have the capability to do municipal audits. So it's not, you know, that we can go out and find someone very easily. That's true in the private sector. There are just four firms after Arthur Anderson went out of business that do private sector audits. Um, but, you know, private sector is a completely different situation. Because of the requirements, and this here's one reason why, of the Federal Single Audit Act, not just any firm can or is willing to perform municipal audits. And because Chapter 30A, which is the uh, procurement statute, is not mandated for the engagement of CPA firms, those firms typically are not prepared or willing to respond to a request for responses from a, a municipality. 
A new audit, audit firm would also have a steep learning curve to get comfortable and effective in reviewing the town's books. And if you're concerned about skullduggery, it will be during such times that bad apples will go to work or politics will intrude and improve certain requirements that may have that may not be best for the town. You know, audit services are not fungible commodities that can be re, uh, reshopped in an arbitrary schedule. It's a relationship built up over town. Now, that doesn't say that this is a bad proposal. I'm just saying that the, there are issues that, that I think were ignored in, in the process of putting this foreign art together. The original proposal for mandatory audit changes was corrected once the petitioners were given some background on the topic. The proposals in this bylaw are now part of the policy of the audit committee, as was mentioned by Mr. Topo, I believe. Uh, so except for reasons of belt and suspenders, <laughs> I think that the Warren article uh, is unnecessary. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Murphy. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Jocelyn Murphy, town meeting member from Precinct 16, speaking on behalf of the advisory committee. The taxpayers of Brookline rightfully expect that the town will manage the town's coffers wisely and legally. Article 4.1 of the town's general bylaws requires that the accounts of the town be kept in accordance with a uniform accounting system approved by the De Massachusetts Department of Revenue. The bylaw also requires that these accounts be audited by an independent auditor. However, as the petitioners have said, at present there, present, there are no provisions in the bylaw for rotation of the lead audit partner or a term limit for the town's contract with the independent auditor. The rotation of audit partners is widely considered to be a best practice in corporations and, muni and municipalities, and in some cases is legally required, such as in California. In recognition of this, and as Mr. Leibowitz said, the recommendation of the Brookline Financial Advisory Committee um, was this, and the petitioners filed the article. The original article sought to impose a five-year limit on the service of the lead audit partner to limit the town's contract with the independent auditor to five years and to require competitive bids for these contracts every 10 years. In response to discussions with the town's audit committee and the finance director concerning the need for flexibility in the auditing process, the petitioner, petitioners agreed to a friendly amendment that, as described by Mr. Toffel, changed the proposed language in section 4.1.2c to clarify that alternative procurement methods chosen at the discretion of town staff would satisfy the competitive bidding requirement, and that an extension of the 10-year procurement requirement could be granted by the select board if requested. In addition, the word restrictions was changed to conditions as a housekeeping amendment in this section. During the advisory committee's review of Article 12, consideration was given to the value of adopting a bylaw versus simply maintaining a policy. And it was determined by the committee that a bylaw would be more effective in compelling compliance over the long run. Questions were also raised about the value of soliciting a bid every 10 years, particularly where it might create additional work for town staff. Overall, the advisory committee felt that audits are important to the financial health and reputation of the town and that soliciting bids would be useful. The advisory committee recognizes that the current auditors, one of only a few who provide these services to municipalities in the area, have a long and favorable history with the town and significant institutional knowledge. As amended, Article 12 anticipates this and provides a mechanism for extending the auditor's contracts when circumstances may warrant such an extension. I note that there is a discrepancy in the materials regarding the committee's vote. It was by a vote of 19 to 2 to 4 that the advisory committee recommends favorable action on the motion as amended. Thank you. Yes, you have a question. Could you please identify yourself? Okay, uh, uh, Madam Ma uh, Moderator, this is uh, my name is A. Wang Wang, uh, Precinct A committee member. So I have a question. Uh, so in that last time, uh, like a uh, special town meeting, like uh, it's request for everybody to address their conflict of interest. So would you mind to maybe have the speaker to address their uh, conflict of interest? Thank you. 
I'm sorry, are you asking if any of the people who spoke in relation to this article had a conflict of interest? Yes, I think that's what I'll agree last time in our town meeting. So. Okay. Uh, I think probably will be the petitioner. Mr. Toffel or Mr. Lebovitz, do you have any financial conflict of interest? I have no financial conflict of interest. Okay. Ms. Frawley. Yes, thank you. Precinct 16, Regina Frawley. Um, a little institutional memory here. The town established a committee on uh, to recommend a high finance committee constituted by CFOs, CEOs, et cetera. They, were, they deal with, with budgets all the time. And this was one of their number one recommendations that there be a rotation city system of some sort. I don't know about the details, every word, every weed in this, but the concept is exactly what was recommended and it's finally being implemented. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Vitolo. Representative Tommy Vitolo, town meeting member at large. Uh, I apologize for not teeing up someone with this question. Uh, I'm persuaded that rotating makes some sense. Uh, I see the value. What I worry about is whether or not the second best bidder for the job, the one we wouldn't normally select, is substantially more expensive than the one we would select if we didn't have to rotate. And so I wonder if anyone can give me a ballpark of what an audit might cost for the least cost bidder and what it might cost for the second least cost bidder. Mr. Carey. Taz Carey, town administrator. I think that's a little too far in the realm of speculation, unfortunately. Um, it's, it's, I'm not sure where we would be, you know, we've been using the same firm for some time now. If we were to go back out on the market now with those four firms, I'm not sure what the delta would be between the lowest bidder and the next lowest bidder. Um, I'm happy to follow up with other communities that have gone out to market more recently to see what they've been getting back, uh, but I don't have the answer current. May I have a second bite at a, maybe an easier question? What did we pay the last time we did an audit? We can look that up right now. Mr. Vitolo, I, I'm not sure I understand your question. Were you asking what we'd be paying for an inferior auditor? What I just asked was how much we paid the auditor the most recent time. No, that I understand. It was your previous question. Yeah, my question is, uh, my concern is about competitive bidding, and if this is forcing us into choosing a much more expensive auditor every once in a while, and I want to weigh that against the advantages of the rotation, but we don't have an answer for that. What it sounds like we do have is an answer for what we Thank paid you. the most recent time. Most recent audit cost us $135,000. Thank you. Ms. Frawley. Yes, I can add some light to this rather than heat. The um, Bidding municipal bidding laws of Massachusetts require the lowest responsible bidder. And the way of determining responsibility requires the town to do its due diligence in vetting them. They have not always done it, and I've exposed some of those contracts. They're now on notice. This is what they have to do. They have to really vet the background, the history, and other just do it. And if they happen to be lower bidding, but they're also judged to be responsible, give them the contract. Mr. Lebovitz, you wanted to make a comment? Yes, thank you, Madam Moderator. I uh, just wanted to offer potentially some clarification to Mr. Vitolo's question. Uh, there was some concern uh, that we addressed, I think, successfully in our negotiations with the Audit Committee and fleshing out this proposal uh, that related to the, the relatively small number of firms on the market that might be able to handle an audit of our needs. Uh, and the way this was addressed in the motion before the body tonight is that we do not require firm rotation. What we require is that a procurement method be undertaken every 10 years, meaning if we went back to market, solicited bids, and did not find a better value or better skilled bid than our incumbent firm, we would have the option to retain the incumbent firm. 
All we're asking is that the town go back to market in a procurement method to be determined by town staff. We are not requiring 30B compliance, the state uh, procurement law with this. I think audits are rightfully um, exempted from that state law, but we just want some kind of procurement to be undertaken every 10 years. Thank you. All right, I will make a motion to, this will have the, there are no speakers, so we're going to vote on this issue. Article, Mr. Lovitz, you are leaving at this tense motion. Oh, okay, you're taking your seat, getting your tablet. All right, we will now vote on Article 12, which is found at page 12-3 of the combined reports. We will be voting on whether or not we should adopt a bylaw, which would require changes requiring rotations of lead partners for audit firms and seeking of competitive bids according to certain schedules outlined in the proposed bylaw. It must pass by a majority vote. We will drop the vote now. Thank you. Okay, the motion passes with 213 yes, nine no, and eight abstentions. Madam moderator? Yes. I'm Michael Burstein, uh, Precinct 12. Will you entertain a motion to adjourn at this time? We have one. I'd like to address a fairly simple article, Article 14. I do not think it will take very long. Thank you. Um, and there is no opposition to it, so I think it will be a fairly straightforward Article. After that, I will certainly entertain one. Okay, we are dealing with Article 14. Article 14 is found on page 14-4 of the combined reports. It is moved by Mr. Van Skoyuk and seconded by Anita Johnson. It is an article that seeks to reduce the number from 19 to 10, which triggers the requirement of the number of units for which a developer must actually include affordable housing units rather than make payments to the Affordable Housing Trust. Currently, if a developer builds a project with four to 19 units, it has to include affordable housing units or make payments to the housing trust. This article would amend the bylaw to allow such payments only with a building from one to 10 units instead of one to 19. And I will call Mr. Van Skoyek to speak on the article first. Good evening, John Van Skoyk from the Select Board. Uh, <clears throat> Warren Article 14 was submitted by Roger Blood on behalf of the Housing Authority Board, otherwise known as HAB. If adopted, the, ar the article would amend Section 4.08 of the Zoning Bylaw, Inclusionary Zoning, to reduce from 19 to 10 the maximum number of units in a proposed project whereby a developer can choose to make a prescribed lump sum payment to the town's affordable housing trust 
in lieu of contributing 15% on-site affordable housing units. Currently, developers of projects with a, excuse me, with four to 19 units can opt to make a cash payment to the housing trust. An argument against cash payments in lieu of on-site units is that allowing developers to buy out of the obligation to provide affordable units has led to the creation of luxury rather than mixed income housing in a number of new developments. While the housing trust has uh, and will continue to be vital for the creation of new affordable housing in the future, the topic of lowering the threshold of section 4.08 has been discussed in a number of settings, lowering the threshold and thereby encouraging the creation of mixed income uh, housing on site will provide more immediate opportunities to address the challenge of affordable, the, the shortage of affordable housing units in Brookline. The select board agrees with the HAB's rationale for proposing this change. In the past, a broader inclusionary zoning threshold allowed the HAB to leverage cash payments to capitalize the housing trust. A well-funded housing trust made possible otherwise financial infeasible affordable housing projects sponsored by mission-based developers, including the Brookline Housing Authority and private nonprofit affordable housing developers. Town-funded projects resulted in the creation of many more affordable units in Brookline than would have been produced by requiring on-site affordable units. Now, however, the recently adopted Community Preservation Act provides an additional source of funding to assist the town in meeting its affordable housing objectives. Town's adoption of the CPA offers a more predictable and accessible source of funding to support future affordable housing projects. CPA funds will greatly augment other resources the town can bring to bear. This additional funding source allows the town to consider a shift in the focus of the inclusionary zoning bylaw to the production of on-site units in mid to large size, that's greater than 11 units, uh, housing developments across town. Developers of smaller projects, four to 10 units, will have the option to make a payment in lieu of on-site units. Ensuring that housing trust contributions will continue. This shift sh could add the, to the, I'm sorry, this shift could add the inventory of affordable housing units in the shorter term. I think it should say to, to the inventory of affordable housing units in the shorter term. The select board acknowledges that the HAB planning board land use, um, the zoning and sustainability sub sub subcommittee of the advisory committee and the full advisory committee support the uh, proposed amendment to section 4.08. And the select board by unanimous vote recommend favorable action on the article as described and it's very lengthy um, in, in your combined reports. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Johnson. Yes, Anita Johnson. No, you're speaking next. Mr. Van Skoyak has uh, described the reasons for the advisory committee's support for this good warrant article. Um, first of all, there will be new revenue from the CPA, which is expected to generate uh, a mil $3 million annually uh, for affordable housing. Second, it is preferable to include affordable housing units within new developed buildings rather than allowing the developers to buy their way out and separate affordable housing units from other housing. It is the recommendation of the advisory committee um, by a vote of 23 to zero to support this warrant article. Thank you. Mr. Blood. I'm Roger Blood, uh, speaking for Unanimous Housing Advisory Board, um, <clears throat> asking for your favorable vote on Warren Article 14. Um, for new uh, town meeting members, the, the Housing Advisory Board is an advisory body only, and its mission is to advance the creation and the preservation of affordable housing in Brookline. Um, in addition to providing policy recommendations where the HAB feels they are needed. Uh, two of our formal responsibilities include um, working with the planning department's housing division in overseeing the uh, implementation of inclusionary 
zoning in town and also the HAB members uh, serve as the trustees of the town's affordable housing trust. <clears throat> One thing that's um, unusual, if not unique and unprecedented about this particular Warren article, if you haven't already noticed this, uh, is that the word count of this article is zero. It only changes a one number in the article and only one digit of a number, actually. Um, you've heard two, I think, uh, good explanations of why we're mainly um, asking for this change. <clears throat> um, for those of you not familiar with inclusionary zoning, very briefly, uh, if a developer wants to provide new multifamily housing in Brookline, uh, the town for many years has had a policy that that should include an obligation to uh, have as part of the project or, as you heard, uh, alternatively, in some instances, cash payments to uh, an affordable housing trust to advance the mission of affordable housing in Brookline. <clears throat> the original inclusionary zoning uh, article going back several decades had a particular flaw in it. Uh, it had the number 10, which we're re returning to at this point, but it was only a number 10. And if you had less than 10 units as a developer, you owed nothing in the way of affordable housing. 10 or more, you had to do the units on site. This produced, perhaps not surprisingly, a number of nine unit projects in Brookline during that early period of time. <clears throat> so the um, Housing Advisory Board uh, amended that particular flaw in the article uh, and created, uh, first of all, a lower number. It went from 10 to six to become more aggressive at, at a lower threshold level for uh, the, uh, the existence of an affordable housing obligation. And at the same time, we increased the other end of that range from 10 to 15. Uh, and, and within that range, the developer was provided a choice. And you've heard uh, uh, the, the uh, use of the cash payment as an alternative uh, has had a very good track record in Brookline in producing a great number of additional affordable housing units. Um, we further, later on, it further expanded that range, and now the threshold uh, for uh, the lower end where a developer has to make a contribution to a, a, an affordable housing the goal is now down to four units in a project, and, and within that, even if only one new unit is added, there's an affordable housing obligation. The reason we also then increased the upper end was quite different. We went from 16 all the way up to 19. It was because um, that uh, really increased the only source of revenue that we had, serious source of revenue, to leverage the funding for our mission-based uh, developers in, uh, in town and other, other in instances where we could use the, uh, the cash funds. Now that the Community Preservation Act has been passed, and you'll be hearing, you already heard a little bit tonight, you're gonna to hear a lot more, a substantial new uh, source of revenue, including for affordable housing, will be uh, a diversified um, uh, source for the town's housing trust fund and take the pressure off of this single source of using our inclusionary zoning bylaw to extract as much cash as possible. So um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a policy reason for what we're doing, and. Uh, but it might be worthwhile taking just this brief time to, to uh, share that with you. Thank you. Okay, we are now going to vote on this article. The article, as you have just heard, will require a developer who builds a project which has four to 10 units to include affordable housing units in the building rather than uh, making payments in lieu of affordable housing units to the housing trust. This lowers the threshold from four to 19 units, which means that there will be more actual affordable housing units built. Excuse, this, excuse me. Excuse yes, me. Ms. Heller. Um, excuse me, Madam Moderator, Nancy Heller, Precinct 8 and Chair of uh, Community Preservation Committee, as you've heard. Um, I just wanted to correct a factual statement that I heard made, I believe, by uh, the Advisory Committee Representative Anita Johnson, that there would be $3 million. I'm sorry, could you step a little further away okay. from that? Okay. Uh, is that better? Yes. Uh, that there would be $3 million available 
for uh, housing each year by the Community Preservation Act. That's not accurate. There would be approximately $3 million, maybe 3.3 or 3.4, depending on the state match and how much we get from our 1% uh, our property tax. But it's devoted to, to different areas. There's not just housing. I wanted to make sure that people are aware that the entire pot doesn't go to just housing. It goes also to, to, commute, to uh, historic preservation, open space, and recreation. And we're mandated by law to designate some of those funds for each of the areas. So I just wanted to correct that. Thank, Thank you for the clarification. All right, we are now going to vote on Article 14. It requires a two-thirds vote to pass. Make sure your tablets are awake and ready to vote and on the Zoom page. Okay, the vote will now drop. You have 45 seconds. The motion easily gets the two thirds, passes by 230 yes, zero no, and four abstentions. I will now entertain a motion to adjourn. Okay, by a voice vote, all in favor say aye. All opposed, have a great uh, Memorial Day weekend. I will see you on May 31st. <laughs>